everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is Ryan Clancy from No Labels, uh, here for a, a bit of a post-debate discussion with um, three people that uh, we really place a lot of credibility uh, in, in what they have to say. I want to just introduce them each uh, individually. We've got uh, Mark Halperin, uh, publisher uh, of the newsletter um, Wide World of News. We've got Drita Nesho, CEO of Harris X, the polling company, and Chris McNulty from Causeway Solutions. Chris's firm um, does a lot of modeling and data analysis. I, I want to start here. Uh, we can get into the numbers in a bit, but Mark, out of all of us, you are the one who's um, you know probably had the most sources who were blowing up your phone last night as as the debate was was going on. And um, I'm curious, um, what is it that you find most interesting about what you've heard from your sources since the debate last night? Um, thank you for inviting me on. Um, look, there's two polls and there's lots of people in between the polls. There are people who say, this person can't be the nominee. He must be replaced. I don't know exactly how he'll be replaced, but he's gotta be replaced because he'll lose 48 states. And there are people who say on the other end, um, this is a guy who has been written off before. Lots of incumbents had bad first debates. There's plenty of time. You can't move Kamala Harris out of the way. You can't trust these other touted replacements. Uh, there's no time for them to build a, a campaign, even if they turn out to be super great. And um, I would say I've heard from more people who are in the first camp than from in the second. Yeah. But the people in the second camp are currently correct. The Bidens have no intention of stepping aside. They have all sorts of tactical things they plan to do in the next week. And they think if they can wait it out for a week, they'll be fine. Uh, they know it's going to be hard work. They know he didn't do well. But their belief is that um, he's still the most likely person to beat Trump and that he's entitled to this. He's won the delegates and that he'll, he'll shoulder on. That could change if Democratic elected officials, donors, Biden, Biden intimates to really press him hard. But I think that that getting him out of the race or agreeing to get out of the race is relatively easy compared to the seven other steps they need to go through to have a strong replacement ticket. So my sources are just who, who, who don't like Trump are despondent. But I would say uh, many of them are being unrealistic about making someone else the nominee. So Mark, can I just ask you real quick, and I don't want to get to, to Dritan and Chris, is when you talk about why those steps would be so hard, um, is it is it politically hard or or is it mechanically hard? It's it's a great question. It's mechanically effortless. The delegates don't have to vote for Biden. If he releases them, they can vote for whoever they want. They can have a bake-off. The problem is Kamala Harris. The first problem is the Bidens. The second problem is Kamala Harris. The next problem is either you do it in a smoke-filled room now and try to anoint a ticket, which would be the optics of which would be horrible. And it's not clear that they're amongst Nancy Pelosi, Jim Clyburn, the Clintons, Obama, Biden, there'd be a consensus pick and, and dealing with the Harris problem. And then the question is, if you don't wait, if you do wait for the convention, uh, how do you sort that out? If you do a bake-off, what if the delegates can't pick anybody? Because there's no obvious choice. There's lots of People who say, well, the obvious choice is Whitmer and Newsom or Shapiro and Moore. There's no obvious choice. And then even if you luck out, Harris gets out of the way. If you don't think Harris is a strong candidate, as most Democrats don't. Harris is out of the way. You get a great ticket. The convention's a love fest. They come out strong. It's still surviving vetting and the building of a national campaign against one of the two or three best presidential candidates of our lifetime who's been up and running for a while now. So it's really the... the, the personal and mechanical issues of building a campaign, selecting a ticket and building a campaign. The DNC rules are zero problem if, if, if Biden steps aside. Preeton, I want to turn to you um, because, you know, you're, you're the one who is probably closest to uh, the real-time reactions of the debate last night. I don't know if Harris has done any overnight uh, polling that you've started to see come in. Um, talk to us about the data that you've seen uh, uh, during the debate and on the back end in terms of, of how it's it's being received. Thanks, Ryan. Well, public opinion will need about 24 to 48 hours to settle for us to register if there's been any meaningful shift in one way or another. And as we've always said, uh, there's very little new information about these two candidates, right? And general perceptions for both of them are largely negative. 
But because there's no new information about them that can essentially come out, and because two thirds of the country has essentially a negative view on both of the candidates, they don't like the choice that's being forced on them, as we've said for a very long time. The debate yesterday was about who was most fit to uh, hold the office or to hold office. And in that regard, expectations for President Biden were significantly higher than they were for former President Trump. And President Biden, as the general reaction suggests, um, didn't live up to those expectations. He came across as feeble. In several instances, he came across as incoherent and unable to uh, put you know, uh, concepts together and land them uh, in the debate. And this is why the reaction to the debate has been what it is, and it's been called a political disaster for the Biden campaign, which asked for the debate uh, in the first place and put the president uh, within that uh, situation. So in terms of the expectations game, um, Biden's performance fell significantly short. It's not that Biden, uh, it's not that Trump won the debate, it's that Biden lost the debate. And there has been some flash polls and some focus groups that were conducted uh, right after the debate or as the debate was running. One was by Frank Luntz, another one was by CNN. And in the CNN poll, it's quite interesting. Two thirds basically said Trump outperformed. He did much better and only one third gave the debate to uh, Biden. I expect that whatever we will see uh, in the next few days in terms of reactions will largely be in line with that. Now, is it enough to shift the polls? Maybe not, but it might shift turnout. And in a situation like the election that we have, turnout will matter a lot. And if you have a lot of Democrats who basically have given up on their standard bearer, think that he's too old or think worse that a vote for him is a vote for Kamala Harris, which, as Mark said, most Democrats don't like, and she has higher negatives than Biden does, then that's very problematic going into November, and there will be a crisis of confidence that will brew between now and then for the for the Biden camp. Chris, how about your, your initial thoughts? I'm muting. Um, Dritan, uh, as he often does, sets me up nicely. Good, good segue. I appreciate it. Um, I look at it like this before the debate um, and, and but I will follow up on Dreton's point before the debate, I would have said and we were saying that, um, look, the electorate has moved ever so slightly incrementally towards the Republicans in the last quarter. But the fact remains the the nature of the electorate before the debate was that Trump was slightly ahead, but had massive vulnerabilities among Republicans and Republican leaning voters. Um, a lot of Republicans were not sold. Republican leaning voters were not sold on him. And frankly, Biden had a slight advantage among independent voters on issues, slight advantage in the polling, and um, even among the double haters. He had a very slight advantage. Um, but the fact remained that there was a bunch of the electorate still locked in the middle that was not deciding yet, was not fully committing yet. That was the pre-debate scenario. Um, the problems Joe Biden had before the before the debate, number one, exceedingly low support among Democrat based voters, particularly acute among low and mid propensity to vote Democrats. The lower you go, go on the propensity to vote scale, the worse Joe Biden's numbers got. That has probably, at the very least, not gotten any better, but probably gotten worse as a result of the debate. So he has exacerbated one of his big uh, weaknesses, number one. Number two, like I said, he had a slight advantage among swing voters on the issues and on the ballot, slight, not great. Um, but I would have said yesterday or two days ago, I would have said that swing voters, the majority of swing voters would have probably voted for Joe Biden uh, slightly. Um, that, he didn't help that because uh, he didn't put the number one argument to bed. He had a slight advantage among double haters on the issues. The issue set, looking at those double haters and the ballot for those double haters that everybody talks about, Joe Biden had a slight advantage going into that. He has undoubtedly not helped. The Haley voters, um, in particular, that type of Haley voter, that soft Republican, we used to call them uh, in no labels land, the people that were Trump policy, but not Trump. 
those voters. He did not help himself with those voters. Those were issues going in that have gotten worse, um, in in my opinion. And um, um, you know, back to one of Mark's points, um, I, I think ultimately here it's on the margins is where it's going to matter. I think Dreton's right. Like you might not see a big push in the polls one way or the other. Um, I, but I think, you know, one of the CNN analysis that I saw was that 15% are reconsidering. 15% is gigantic in the world of presidential politics to be reconsidering at this point. Uh, and I would almost have to say that 14.75% of that 15% uh, of that total are people reconsidering on Biden after yesterday. Um, so mean, that's gigantic. Yeah, one of the things that was obviously, a lot of things different about this debate. One of which though was, look, in, in the aftermath, even when a candidate has a has a poor debate, you know, it, there is a reasonable people can disagree element. And usually the people in the spin room can find some way to spin it into positivity. One of the things that was really striking if you were watching the post debate coverage last night, was even President Biden's most ardent supporters couldn't say anything other than what they saw. One thing I did notice, though, is Vice President Harris in her interview, she said something that it would seem to me is likely to be how they're going to try to handle this going forward, which is she said, look, we're talking about uh, a 90 minute performance versus a three and a half year track record in the three and a half year track record. That's what matters. So it seems like that's what they're going to lean into. My question for you is, um, if the assumption or the hope of the Biden camp is that this will blow over in a week, do you think that's possible? Do you, do, do you think it's it's possible that this debate might not be as consequential as it feels the next morning? Chris, maybe start start with you. Yeah, I'll start real quick. I, I think the cat is out of the bag. You can't have all these Democrat operatives and apparently senators and such behind the scenes saying we should think about taking him off the ballot and go back to everything's hunky-dory. The cat's out of it. The damage has been done. It's now a matter of what to do with the damaged scenario, in my opinion. I think the cat's out of the bag. You can't undo that damage. Let me read you the list of prominent Democrats who've calling for Biden to get out of the race since last night. Done. No one. Joe Scarborough did. But on the Today Show, owned by the same corporate parent, the coverage was practically as much about Trump's factual errors as it was about Biden's performance. Um, people are afraid of the Bidens and the Biden political machine. They're contrary to the Biden's glossy reputation. They're vindictive and cutthroat. So um, he'll, he's, he, he was very good at his rally last night after the debate. I don't know if you saw that. He was very good. He'll be probably very good today in, in, uh, in uh, North Carolina. Uh, they're going to get the groups who support him, the, you know, the major Democratic groups, labor and women's groups and gay rights groups to, you know, reaffirm their support. They're going to hold hands with the donors. And they really do think if they make it through a week and say the line you said, it's not about 90 minutes, it's about three years to point out privately to those who need it. It's very difficult to replace him. And and be confident you're replacing and trading up. And they can say, we have our convention, we have another debate, maybe he'll do some interviews and hope those go well. So again, I, I have huge respect for Chris. And, and as, as I said, I know tons of people who feel exactly the way Chris does, but I think they're, they're louder, they're the smart people and they're on cable and calls like this. But until you see Jill Biden say, I'm willing to stop being first lady, I think the base case remains. He's not going anywhere as flawed as he showed himself to be last night. So and, Mark, and Mark, Mark, to clarify, I, I don't disagree with your analysis at all. I think you're right. He's staying right where he is. When I say the damage is done, I mean, there's been damage done in, a, in the minds of the electorate and, and some swing voters. And I don't think you can undo that. So Mark, I, I just want to confirm this because um, you know I, I haven't had a chance to dive into the X sphere this morning, but you're saying, so as of now, aside from some, you know, there are some former elected officials who are suggesting he should get out, but um, there are no democratic sitting uh, house members, senators that you're aware of that are saying it's time for the president to step away. 
Well, there are ones who, 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 who thought privately that for some time. Sure. There's no one who said it publicly. And the cost of saying it publicly would be immense. Um, ask Steve uh, Phillips. Yeah, exactly. Um, ask no labels. You know, the cost of cro crossing the Bidens and Ron Klain is immense. I think that, that um, again, let I, I can't imagine the mentality of someone who would write a check to Joe Biden right now. Um, I just did a call with three pollsters, uh, almost as good as these two guys, and they didn't think the horse race numbers would move very much. They thought party ID would. But if you don't have public polling collapse, if you don't have donors going public or members of Congress or governors going public, I think he can survive. He had one path before. I don't think that path is now closed. I think opening another path is hard. No one's ever won with one path. But you, you have to you have to understand that this is his whole life. It's Joe Biden's whole life. They have huge ships on their shoulder and they continue to believe even after last night. And they might even be right. This ticket has the best chance to beat Donald Trump compared to the alternatives, even after last night. I want to talk a little bit about Trump. Um, you know, the consensus seems to be, look, obviously he was crisper, better presentation, as is often the case with Trump. Um, pretty factually challenged in a lot of instances. I, I think I can say with a high degree of confidence that uh, Nancy Pelosi did not admit January 6th was her fault uh, and lots of other things. Um, but what 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 is your initial read on Trump's performance last night um, and, and what it means going forward? Um, Drita, why don't, why don't we start with you? Well, I thought I thought he did um, he did well. I mean, uh, he landed several punches, especially with regards to taxes, with regards to inflation, and with regards to the key question where voters are anchoring on, which is, who was a better president? When you look at the totality of things, the perception amongst voters is that despite everything that happened, Trump was actually a better president than Biden. And this is reflected in many different polls, right, that ask the question, the job approval question, and actually Trump is on top of Biden by 15, 17 points. And it's not as easy as saying in the past, well, he's a former president, therefore he benefits from being out of the uh, spotlight and out of the pressure chamber because Trump is very much front and center and Trump has been weighed down by all of these different legal, uh, legal cases. I also thought that on the issues um, where he's most vulnerable, January 6th, and also on abortion, um, he either sidestepped them, he sidestepped a lot of the January 6th uh, questions, and Biden had a moment to put pressure on him, and unfortunately, Jake Tappert actually shifted the conversation away from uh, January 6th and from Trump taking a clear position on what happened on that day. And similarly, on abortion, I, you know, Trump basically uh, tried to play it all way, uh, all the different ways and tried to say that I have flexibility, I have my own personal beliefs, and I have basically a view that this decision should be left on a broader basis to the states. So um, I don't think he loses anything um, from last night's debate. I think his base is as energized as ever, if not more. And really where I would look for is enthusiasm amongst the Democratic base, because this election will be a turnout election or an election that's decided by turnout. Uh, many people in the middle will either not vote um, or if they have to hold the nose, um, it's fairly split. And um, as Chris said, and I agree with him wholeheartedly, is the cat is already out of the back, right? With the key question about Biden is that can he govern uh, despite all the different policy issues? And uh, it's very difficult to rewind uh, uh, from what people saw uh, last night. And that will linger. That perception will linger with him all the way between now and November. There could be other events that occur that change the nature of the conversation and the focus of how the election is fought. But Trump doesn't lose anything. If anything, he gets a jolt of energy amongst his base. And Biden loses because his base is already asking the question of, 
is he the right st standard bearer? And that's ultimately what the map boils down to. Yeah. Whether or not you see a bump or a change in the national polls doesn't really matter. I would look at the state polls and then I would look at the turnout metrics and see how Democrats are saying whether or not they're willing to show up after uh, yesterday's debate. Chris, you got something? Yeah, the other thing I would say is that um, for a long time, it's going to make messaging harder for Joe Biden as well, and 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 for the, his allies in the media, and both guys have allies, allies in the media. Um, but for months now, if not years, Biden's allies in the media have been saying, don't believe your lying eyes. He's fine. There's some super cuts out there right now, a bunch of prominent media personalities saying um, he's sharp. He's his best ever. Uh, the aforementioned Joe Scarborough, Mark mentioned earlier, three weeks ago, said he's his best ever, his best self. So when those same media allies now come around, if they do, when he doesn't get off the ticket and, they, and they, they're on board and they're trying to be supportive, the believability factors, the effectiveness of that messaging is going to be just null, uh, even with people that lean Biden's way, in my opinion. Uh, because the media has kind of, in my much of the media, uh, has has told you this is a ruse. This is a Republican fairy tale. This is a this is a, 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 a what do they call it? A supercut, you know, deep fake that yeah, you're right. Saying. Cheap not, fake. There's an hour and a half worth of deep fake yesterday. Yeah, Mark. What about the sources? Um, your sources on the Republican side in and around the Trump camp. Um, what, what's their, uh, what's their read on what happened last night? What it means? Uh, <clears throat> they already thought they were going to win. Uh, they're more confident they're going to win there. I thought I've never seen Donald Trump events empathy. And I thought I saw flashes of that last night. Uh, but then he, you know, went in for the kill on a few occasions and they're trying to basically just make sure the press stays on the story subtly, uh, influencing it, but they don't really need to do much. They're, you know, following the old dictum when your opponent's uh, dying, let him do it himself. So uh, they, they, you know, they feel somewhat vindicated because um, like most Americans, they've seen Joe Biden's decline and have been puzzled and in their case, angered by the media's favor, uh, if, if failure to cover it. Um, but they, um, they, they are uh, going, you know, President Biden, Trump was already planning to be on the offense today and go to Virginia with the key, you know, time real estate of the day after the debate. Uh, they're talking Virginia, New Hampshire, Minnesota, New Mexico, um, and uh, consolidating their support in the four Sunbelt states that are considered by some to be battlegrounds. So um, they feel pretty great about it. And, um, you know, I think they uh, they have a more bullish view, as I do, than, than my colleagues do about how Trump did last night. But um, but they know it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, one of the things that obviously, if you're part of no labels, it's impossible not to think about today is you watch that debate. Of course, I was watching it. And you say to yourself, as you're watching it, this is why no labels did what it did for two years for, for a moment like this. Um, and I'm, and I'm, I'm curious, you're, you're all thinking um, one of the things that I just think has been a defining element of these last uh, this last year is the public sending this unmistakable signal that they're not happy and they want something better. And the political establishment, often on the Democratic side, if we're being honest, they remind me of like Kevin Bacon at the end of Animal House when there's like, you know, the, the, the riot in the parade and he's just yelling, all is well, all is well. And everybody knows it's not. Everybody knew President Biden wasn't fine. Everybody knew, you know what? We probably should open up the debate, have some more choices, be it in the Democratic primary, be it a no labels ticket. And yet here we are. We are stuck now three or four months with the election. Go ahead, Mark. I'm... No, that's all right. I, I, I'm waiting patiently. I just want to make sure I can speak to this because I've been thinking about it since last night. Yeah. Um, uh, you and Margaret and Liz and Marianne and Sam and others on here and Nancy um, showed extraordinary courage and bravery and foresight uh, because you understood what was happening. I'm speaking carefully 
so I don't have to get a call from a lawyer. But I'm thinking in particular of one longtime no label supporter with whom I spoke and many of you spoke passionately and who said, you know what, I'm sticking with Biden. Biden's the answer. We just got to all get behind Biden because that's the only way to stop Trump. And, 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 and I, I was so troubled because there's a very smart person, so troubled by the choice he made because this was so predictable. We called it an insurance policy for a reason. This was so predictable. And they devoted significantly more time and effort to destroying a patriotic movement to respond to the will of the people than they did to being honest with themselves about the condition of Joe Biden. And the country is now gonna have to deal with the implications of that. And it makes it makes the work that you all did more brave, more um, thoughtful, and more tragic because of the outcome. You'll never be able to convince me, look, we were talking about this this morning. I know a lot of names got thrown around, um, you know, uh, as prospects for the, for the no labels ticket, but look, one person we always imagined as embodying who could be on this ticket was somebody like, Admiral William McRaven, you know, former head of Navy SEALs, led the team that uh, took out bin Laden, head of the University of Texas. If you can envision a person like that on the stage last night against those two characters, you will never convince me that we wouldn't have woken up this morning with a historic shift in where we're headed as a country because the choice would have been so clear. Um, and what seemed impossible yesterday might have seemed possible today. What I want to ask Chris and Dreeton about, though, is what do you think this is, what happened last night? What do you think this is going to do to turnout? Um, I mean, is this, is, is just nobody going to show up for this election? Ahead, well, let, yeah, let me, let me just make a point to dovetail on Mark's point. Uh, the big missed opportunity in the debate last night is that while Americans are struggling, these two candidates were speaking about their golf swings. And all of the conversation, all of the conversation without a fault was focused on the past, right. not the future. And that is the big striking difference between what No Labels efforted to do, supported by all of the people in this call and many others, and where we are stuck today, which is we tried to have a conversation about the future around common sense ideas that we knew would bring Americans from both the left and the right together on a series of grand compromises to move the, part, uh, the country forward. And to me, that's what was very sad about last night's debate. I think that it was a low point in modern American politics and in modern American debates where you have two candidates that instead of talking about the future, they talk about their golf game, which frankly, no one cares about. And so um, everyone here, beginning with the good folk at No Label, are to be commended for their uh, vision and their efforts, um, especially in the face of all the pressure from the democratic political machine. And I think that there is a question to be asked, really, which is the task of bringing forward new leaders still remains. And no one is the flag bearer for that task. Or put differently, no labels is still the closest flag bearer to that task. And I think that work needs to continue in the near future and beyond so that we don't have another election where we're stuck with bad choices as we are right now. Chris, you had something out there? Chris. Yeah, to, to your question about turnout, what happens to turnout. Um, um, take you back to the midterms, 2022. Uh, all the modeling suggests that at the end of the day, um, it was a base turnout election. Um, and what I mean by that is if you look at hard Democrats and hard Republicans, their turnout exceeded what the models said it was going to be. So that meant both sides are turning out a few more people through their operations, through their messaging, than even the models suggested among hard partisans. There was a dramatic 15, sometimes 20 percent underperformance among swing, among the big middle that just stayed home. This is even before Biden and Trump are on the ballot. This is midterms. This is just that big middle looking at the parties and saying what they don't like. This is one of the things that we were selling uh, when we were talking about the unity ticket, uh, with the fact that, hey, there's this big middle that's just shrinking away. Um, we then, when you presented with Biden and Trump on the ballot, 
Um, that same big middle, we see it in modeling now. We've reserved our next quarter of modeling is going to go into the field here uh, in, in the next three or four days or so. We waited until after the debate to see what would happen because it would be a seminal moment. Uh, my sense is that we already see in the modeling that that big middle is not enthused about, obviously, either candidate, but also not about turning out. Um, my sense is this is just going to further depress that scenario, and you're going to have a very low turnout presidential election where hard partisans may uh, show up to the degree that we would expect them to, but that big middle is going to stay home. At the very least, they're going to skip that top of the ticket race. I want to thank you all, you guys, so much for joining us this morning. But before we leave, um, I, I want to get us all on the record with a little prediction, um, which is this. End of, end of, of August, Democrats have their convention. Um, I'm curious to know when that convention gathers, is Joe Biden going to be the Democratic nominee for president? Mark, why don't we start with you? What do you think? I always go with the political philosopher Yogi Berra. Prediction is difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> That's such Thanks. a non answer. All right, fine. Uh, you, the base case is Biden. Base case is Biden. Okay. Uh, Chris, what do you think? Yeah, yes, it's Biden. Dreton? I agree. I can't, I, I'm the moderator, so the moderator's prerogative, <laughs> I, I don't have to say anything. <laughs> I get to, I get to, you I get set to, us I up. Make the rules. Yep. Um, look, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Uh, no labels for um, hopping on this call and, uh, and much more to come.